It's beautiful today. Okay, gorgeous. <laughs> I like what God can do when He brings a new day. As a matter of fact, I pretty much like every day that God brings a new day because I kind of enjoy it. You know, it's it's nice to see what God may do. You know, there's a perspective that some people have. You know, they they say, well. You know, Christians are are just a bunch of hypocrites. Well, yeah, that's true. Well, this this Christianity stuff is you know kind of like you know not real because people don't do what they say they'll do. Well, technically, I'll agree with them because you see, if this quote unquote Christianity was about doing things, then I'd say, hey, you know what? There's probably a lot better things you could do than what's been done for you. Because you see, don't confuse the process of what God is doing with the results of what God wants to accomplish. Our Father in Heaven knows, first of all, we are pre-programmed to fail. Yeah, it's in your genetic makeup. You are under a curse. You've been cursed from the moment you were conceived to the moment you die in sin. You were cursed. You're under that curse. You know, you could try to deny it. You could say, oh, well, you know, because I'm a Christian, I'm not under the curse. Well, yes and no. Your flesh is going to die because God said, the soul that eats of this fruit shall surely die. And they did. And your flesh will die. As a matter of fact, you already know that. You know the body you're in is wearing down. It's, you know, falling apart. It's getting older. It's deteriorating. From the moment you were born, as a matter of fact, after you were conceived, once you came out into the world, you kind of started mutating and declinating, not escalating. Meaning that you're not getting better, you're getting worse as far as your flesh is concerned. Oh sure, it was growing and you know there were a lot of stem cell developments, you know, and you became part of the program in your DNA and RNA that, you know, was pretty much decided by God in creation. But there's also something else that's in that DNA for your flesh. And that's the curse of sin. Which means not only will you grow your body such as it is, it will end at a point in time because of the massive amounts of deterioration that's going on from the mutation that was caused in creation that we call corruption. The perfection of creation was corrupted in the beginning. And so you were and you are in corruption, believe it or not. So when you try to do good, there's also present with you to do wrong. You know, it's kind of like stupid, but they say, well, which dog in you? You know, does the, does the good dog get fed more or the bad dog get fed more? Whichever one you feed more is going to win. No, it's not. That's false. There's no good dog in you and there's no bad dog in you. Matter of fact, the dog's resented. There is, in fact, your propensity to do evil. You have the opportunity to do wrong. You have the choice to be just going along with the flow and because of the corruption you were born in, you are automatically condemned. No questions asked. No ifs, ands, or buts. Because you're corrupt. You are. But you see, God knew that. So God took care of that. And that's why it's not about what you do, but it's about what God has done for you. When we look at the corruption we're in, we try to fix it. You know, we try to be good, act good, think good, you know, do the right thing. You know, you hear people say it all the time. Well, you know, use a little common sense. Now, I don't know about you, but I look around the world and I don't see any common sense. As a matter of fact, what's common 
is stupid. <laughs> Everybody has the opportunity to be stupid at some point in time. And quite frankly, I see stupid people lots of times. Well, maybe they're not stupid people, but they do stupid things. So trying to do something to fix what is your nature to do wrong just doesn't work. You see, humanism likes the idea of trying to say that we're getting better by our intelligent way of looking at ourselves and trying to legalize or legislate or make in some social mores or morals a way that we say man becomes better. It's called almost a part of manifest destiny, but kind of like this manifested way of choosing his own destiny and his own God to make himself out to be God. Well, the Bible had an interesting statement on that. It was kind of short. Now you're gods, you'll die like men, period. End of story. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, you can act like God. You can pretend you're a God. You can, you know, make your own religion. You can make your own way of salvation, so to speak. But when you die, reality sets in. What happens after you die really determines what kind of quote unquote God you were. God, since he created us, in fact, has the freedom to determine our destiny, no matter what we think, whether it be, you know, all the Arminianism versus Calvinism versus religion versus, you know, predestination versus free will versus all the stupid arguments that people come up with. The reason why they're stupid arguments is because you're talking about God who created you on the one hand and you as a created being on the other hand. You're in denial when you think you can tell God what to do based upon your religion. Because, frankly, that's just your understanding of what you're seeing God already doing. You don't know the truth. And that's why God said, I will reveal the truth. I will show you the truth. And so he sent his son. God, knowing that we were corrupted, knowing that we were created to be perfect, knowing that the only way to be in heaven was to have perfection, said, you can't do it. I know that. So who can I send? Who will I send to cause this corruption to put on incorruption? Who can I send that will cause this evil to be overcome by good? Whom can I send that will make known to all of creation the truth of why I created creation? And Jesus popped up and said, You're mine. Hey, over here. Send me. So God said, Well, I've, I've sent my prophets. You know, I, I, I've sent people that I chose to be servants. You know, to, to serve the people and to minister to them and to tell them about God. I've sent pastors and teachers and elders and deacons and all these other people to serve. And the people didn't listen to them. You know, people didn't listen to the kings that I sent because the people wanted a king, so I gave it to them. They wanted government, so I gave it to them. Now they're like, I don't want it. And just like in America today, people are looking around and saying, I don't like it. Well, deal with it. <laughs> you wanted it, you got it. Guess what? <laughs> you get what you paid for. <laughs> But the point is, God said, no, I will send my son. Maybe, maybe they'll listen to him. And so God sent his son. And Jesus, quite frankly, laid out the entire perspective from God's point of view. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble, blessed are the, you know, don't judge, all these other things, don't kill, I mean, all kinds of things. Things that people today are trying to reinterpret in some way to make man in charge we have the right to bear guns, then God in charge, hey, you could die by those guns too. <laughs> you know, frankly, keep your gun you know, and go ahead, you'll get killed by it. So, the point is, God saw the corruption and said, I can give you a way of salvation. I can give you an opportunity to find a better way, a better life, a choice to make that you would not have to be banished, removed from perfection. You could, in some way in the near future, become perfect, as I told you I would do for you, as I promised I would. Because you see, from the beginning of creation, God said, hey, I've got it covered. 
corruption will put on incorruption and the evil that men do will be removed permanently in my time and my way and God will do that one day he will remove that evil that corruption that's come into the world through sin and remove he who started it in the beginning from the face of the earth and God will create a new heaven and a new earth but in the meantime revealing how God is love has been his purpose in sending his son he wanted to reveal completely what perfection meant perfection was the beauty of holiness perfection was this whole aspect that God is love and that in revealing his love towards you in that while you were yet still corrupt that while you were yet still a sinner God would die for you and his son would manifest that so that you would be able to look at something that was done and say obviously God loves me you'd be able to say obviously this is God who loves obviously there's nothing I can do about it obviously because you see that's the point of what the crucifixion was about that's the point of what all of this is about it's not about your life to get something and go run with it you know like a football and go score a touchdown or you know a fly ball is hit to you and you have to catch it or else you know the inning isn't over you know you got to keep going no the reality is you are discovering who God is you are uncovering the fact that God is love and God wants to manifest love to the world through you God wants to reveal how you can take out of your life those things that are corrupted and put into your life those things that are incorruptible. You see, seeking first the kingdom of God was never about just looking at heaven and going, oh, well, someday I'll play harps, you know, in the fly by pie in the sky, you know, spirit in the sky routine. I'm going to, you know, finally give peace a chance, like Lennon said, you know, but no. The reality is to know God. Because once you know Him, it's just like someone you fall in love with. When you fall in love with someone and you know them, you love them more because of their nature. You become more enraptured with them because of who they are. You become more fulfilled because you're doing what God has wanted you to do from the beginning, which was to know Him, to have fellowship with Him, to walk with Him, to talk with Him, to have an interpersonal relationship with Him. Oh sure, some people start off slow and they may spend an eternity getting to know God. But the reality is God is patient and long-suffering. God is everlasting in His way of giving you everlasting life. It will last forever. And that's the point of why incorruption was going to be given to you to put on because you are corrupted in your thought life. You're corrupted in your vision. You're corrupted in your emotions. You're corrupted in every part of your life that you could possibly think of. But Jesus wasn't. You see, Jesus came as perfection and revealed God. God looked down at Jesus and saw his life and saw everything that he went through and all the obedience that he learned in telling him what to do. And God spoke to him and told him what to do every day. According to what the scripture says, hey, every day you got up before, you know, says, to his family even when he was a young man. He says, don't you know I must be about my father's business? God was telling him what to do, where to go, what to say, how to be, where to live. Spoken to him, you know, as a still small voice. In the ear, I will whisper in your ear whether to turn to the left or the right. In other words, all of it's there in the word. It was obvious what Jesus did. He proved we could and we should do as he said. So when, in, when perfection came and lived the life that it was meant to, then all of imperfection was taken upon himself spiritually so that we could suddenly discover hey God is doing what he said he would do and that's why you can't do anything about it you really can't add to your standing with God you can't change how God looks at you you can't rearrange you know your circumstance make yourself better than you are and you can't you know take salvation one day and get rid of it the other day you know it's not a question of eternal salvation it's a question of choice. Are you in the Son or is the Son in you? In other words, if you're not in the Son, you don't have eternal life. That's perfectly pure and simple. If you haven't asked Jesus to, you know, basically put on 
ink corruption on you or to fill you with his spirit or fill you with his love or you know however you want to look at it I mean there's a lot of ways that the scriptures talk about it and it it involves a dimensionality that you don't understand you know just like you don't understand 3d I mean we have height depth you know perspective you know there's 4d because it's deteriorating and there's time element involved and all that kind of other things but you don't understand the spiritual dimension any more than I can tell you how 3d works from 2d you know a 2d thing doesn't make much sense to me any more than a 3d does I just accept it the same thing is true about life, eternal life. I just accept it. Because someone came from there and told me about it, Jesus. And I've proved it and demonstrated it. He's demonstrated it to me. So, the spiritual dimension and the reality of that in my life, as it's working out of my life, through my life, to others, I can see how it affects people. And that's to know, in a more intimate and personal way than ever before, how God is dealing in life with people to change their corruption of what they are into his incorruption of what he is because that's what you're really being changed from and going into letting him do his work as you rest in his promises you rest in his accomplished work you rest in him because it's grace by that you're saved. And the grace is something that's not appropriated, per se, but it's given by God. And that's done through a relationship where you ask for it. You ask God, hey God, you know, I think I am corrupted. You know, I've, I've seen how, you know, I would like to, you know, be different. Or I've, I've, I want to lose weight. You can call that corruption if you want to. You know, I've, I've seen how I want to do this. You know, be nicer, be, be whatever it is. You know, I don't know, football player, I'm kidding. But you know, you, you know flat out, if you've been around or you've been living for very long and you're past 20, just kidding, <laughs> you, you know you're not perfect. You know you're not, you know you're provocable. You know you get mad, you get angry, you get kicked off at times. What if you were perfect? What if you could be? What if you could be put into a position where God says, you're my perfection? Huh, wouldn't that be nice? You see, that's what really God is all about. He wants to change your life, not for abundance and money and prosperity like you hear all these things, and not as though you know, the world is wrong in criticizing Christians, because they're right. Christians are hypocrites. Christians are failures. Christians do blow it. Christians do make mistakes. Christians are wrong at times. Christians are hypocrites. But there's one other thing that Christians are, and they've been put into Let's call it the dunk tank, so to speak. They've been dunked in, you know, if you want to call baptism a dunk tank. They've been dunked in, you could call it the blood of the Lamb. They've been dunked in this idea of God's incorruption. They've been put into a place where God says, hey, I don't care. Yeah, you're right. The world accuses them. Satan accuses them. Matter of fact, everybody accuses them. And, they, and God simply says, you're right. They're guilty. Guilty as hell. They deserve to go to hell. As a matter of fact, every Christian I know, no matter who they are, deserves to go to hell. I don't care who they are or what they've done or how they've lived their life. They do deserve to go to hell. But there's only one reason they're not going to hell. And that's because of what Jesus has done, not because of how good they are, not because they have faith, not because they have works, not because of any other thing that they could possibly put a thumb mark or a little check mark on and say, I did this, I did this, I did this. No. It's because God did it. You see, that's the point of salvation. God did it. God gave it. God fulfilled it. God is perfect. Now, the weird thing is, in that perfection, he chose you. Now, that's weird. I don't know why he chose you. <laughs> I mean, quite frankly, you're imperfect. But then, I haven't a clue why he chose me. Because I really am imperfect. <laughs> I'm really corrupt, just as you are. You're, you're one miserable, corrupted being. But in Jesus, in Christ, you're a new creation. You're something that doesn't fit the mold. You're something that doesn't work in the way people look at it. Because people always look at the outward things and say, oh, well, Buddha was a good man, you know, and oh, Mahatma Gandhi was, you know, wonderful. Or, oh, you know, my, my latest Zen leader has got me, you know, feeling so much. <gasps> Nirvana. 
Well, maybe for a while, but then you blow it again, don't you? Sooner or later, eh, that corruption comes rising back up, you know, and you see something's not right here. I need a new nature. I need a new program. I need something different about my creative corruption that's inside me. I need to be incorrupt. And quite frankly, the only person, place, or thing that ever gives you incorruption is God, because he created you. Now, what he does is he causes a new creation to be born out of corruption. In the place where you're at today, however you are, wherever you are, you're very much a corrupted image of God. But I can tell you something else. If you're willing to be a hypocrite, be a, a sinner, be blown out, be you know the despicable person you are, honestly before God, and just tell Him the truth, yes, you're corrupted, God is willing to say, hey, I'm willing to give you incorruption. I'm willing to look at you as perfect. I'm willing to say, your imperfection is putting on perfection because you're accepting the fact of what my son has done. You are willing to give up your life and lay down your imperfect way so I can be the potter, so to speak, and you the clay, and I can make you into what I want you to be in your imperfection, in your corruption, in your day to day. You could be perfect. Kind of weird, huh? Only God, or only the God, the living God, the creator of the universe could do something like that because I'll be honest with you, there is no one I know that can take something crooked and make it straight or take something straight and make it crooked. At least not as far as what God means by that. And there definitely is no one that can take someone like you as corrupted as you are and make you perfect. No one can do that. Not even you. Except God. Now that blows my mind.